essentially what you've written here is um, Pandora study was generalized as a sample of the study was 72 children, both 36 boys and 36 girls, around the ages of three to six years old. All the students were obtained from the same place, which was Stanford Nursery School. Okay, very good. The study was quite reliable as the procedure was standardized with the experiment having two observers to rate the child early. This shows integrated reliability and the extraneous variables were controlled, making the experiment replicable. Also, like what with extraneous variables? We have to mention that what extraneous variables. Also, the results of different groups of children showed consistent results when exposed to an aggressive model. The experiment collected both quantitative and qualitative data as Bandura had an objective record of number of imitative actions in each category and assigned the scores to behaviors such as hitting, kicking, and verbal aggression. Also, qualitative data was recorded when he recorded the details of behavior performed by the children. A limitation of the Bandura study is that it lacks ecological validity. This experiment was conducted in the laboratory and it was done in the natural environment. Not done in the natural environment. The this suggests that the experiment might not be accurate in representing real life situations. The Bandura study also raised ethical issues which exposed the aggressive model to the children. What ethical issues? You have to name them. Which exposed the aggressive model to the children, which was that they exposed them. Okay, so you have to mention ethical issues such as psychological harm. That then you have, okay, you've written it. The children might have been oh, great. This is fine. The experiment may not be generalized. Okay, so and this may show. Okay, yeah, that's a solid answer. You get an, like that's a good solid eight on ten answer. The only reason why I'd cut eight is number one, you need to be more clear, you know, clear about what extraneous variables are you controlling, and over here as well. When you're saying generalizable and when you're giving me the details of the sample, you will have to mention that these are the details which make it representative. So why are you giving me the details? So you have to give me an evidence or an example or a link to why you're giving me the details in the first place, essentially. So that's that. And yeah, other than that, it's a very good answer. That's a very good, very good effort. That's really great. Do you understand how to do this now? Yes, sir. Okay, so I don't want you to spend the whole class doing another question, but I want you to just write down. Um, so when I go back and I look at, we discussed the studies the other day. Right, so when I look at um, Savedra, okay. Now that's something that I, that is a case study, right? So I want you to just write me, not even, not the whole answer or anything. You've got to like, let's say maximum 10, 15. Okay, that's that's the only amount of time I think we should be spending on this, nothing more. Still, Savedra, I just want you to write me two strengths and one weakness. Because this is something that people find very difficult to generally find strengths is because it's not generalizable people say it's not reliable people say it's ethically wrong so you know finding strengths is the difficult task here so i want you to look at savidra and i want you to see two two strengths and one weakness and you've got let's say around about 15 minutes to do it before we start our new chapter new study everything all right thank you
Are we done? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. So you've said the, strength, the study was reliable as the procedure was very standardized. They used a psychometric measure in the experiment to measure the participant's level of stress towards the button. Okay. The experiment was balanced at the part, as the participant went through various methods and was studied over a time period. This experiment also comes with follow-ups until... Okay. Now, this pointer is a very good pointer where you said that it was studied over a long time period. But in order to prove your pointer, you will have to give more explanation for it. So here, if you were if you were to be marked out of two, I'd give you one out of two, not two out of two. Why? Because you're saying that it was over studied over a time period, which makes it valid. But how does it make it valid? So maybe you will have to mention the fact that it was studied over a time period and that makes it valid because you get more data. Okay, and it is a longitudinal study. So you get to witness the changes. You get to study the changes as well. Then you've said the study cannot be generalized as though they only had one participant in the study. The methods in the study might be responded differently by other people who had different phobias. Uh, absolutely great. Amazing. Good job. So this is good. This is great. Okay. So any questions for now? Um, not really. Okay. So I'll just give you a little bit of an overview on our next approach, which is our cognitive approach so we've done social approach we've mm. done learning approach we're now going to be focusing on cognitive approach right so cognitive approach is three studies okay first we will be i'll just introduce you to a little bit of to what cognitive approach is what cognitive means but right now um the Thing, things that you need to know is that we we'll, again for each approach we've got three studies and for cognitive approach we will have three studies one of them is andre okay uh, it's about doodling like when you make those drawings in your notebook then there is baron cohen this is about autism and eyes test okay and then we have pozulo which is about lineups okay so we're going to go in the same order we're going to start with andre then we're going to do baron cohen and then we're going to move on to pozulo okay um so essentially let me just uh, send you uh, what we'll be looking at and then explain the cognitive approach to you. So we're going to start with the, the cognitive approach, which I'm just sending to you right now. There's just very smaller subtopics in the cognitive approach that we just have to look over. Okay, so I have sent them to you. I'll just share my screen as well. Right. So essentially, um, what the cognitive approaches is what we're going to try and understand, which is the introduction of the cognitive approach. Um, besides what's written in the book, just an overview, cognitive approach in the simplest of senses is to understand your brain. OK, so when we are studying psychology, we are trying to understand every single thing related to our psyche, how our psyche is when it's learning, how our psyche is when it's in social situations. And now when we look at co cognitive, we look at how psyche is with feelings, emotions, thoughts. Right. So everything to do with the brain that comes under psyche is what we are trying to or tending to focus upon uh, a few things that you will need to know and the meaning of a few things that you will need to know is language memory thinking because all of these things are part of the cognitive approach okay so over here they're telling us the main assumptions they're saying information is processed through the same route in all in 
humans that is input process output in a similar way of to as to how information is processed by a computer people have individual differences in their cognitive processing such as attention language thinking and memory these processes can also help to explain better emotion so what they're saying two things that we assume when we do the cognitive approach or when we study the cognitive approach is number one that we assume that for each and every human they have a system like a computer has a system where you send in one thing and then the human processes that particular thing and then they give the output of that thing okay so it's called the input output approach okay so you send in an input and then something you process that input in your brain and then the thought process comes out which is called the output that is the number one assumption assumption in the sense that this these are beliefs that we hold about the cognitive approach number two is that we say that all individuals have a very different cognitive processing approach so that means that their language their memory their thinking their feelings every single thing their behavior all of these things are very different and every individual has individual differences between them so your all of everybody has a separate and different cognitive processing which means the way their brain functions and the way they process information make sense so they're saying so under cognitive approach what we are essentially looking at we're saying that our behavior so we in learning approach we said that our behavior is learned and in social approach we said that our behavior is molded by the society the society asserts our behavior in cognitive approach we say that our mental state or our mental events is basically what is determining our behavior our brain is determining our behavior so we say that our thoughts our memories all of these things are basically determining our my behavior so they're saying that cognitive psychologists often take this what they take this as the information processing approach first information is received through senses this information is called input some of this information may be filtered out at this stage especially if it is irrelevant to what we are currently doing okay so they're saying that there's this process called information processing approach and that is essentially what is applied okay and you take information uh through your senses which uh which is called input and then you process that information and then you think about that or you you declare a decision making thing or you declare a decision and that is essentially what you call the output clear till here yes okay then they're just saying that your input basically go through a filter process as well so not every information that you have listened to or heard you don't just take processes and take it out or you know you don't do and everything about it so some information you need to know that what information is received and you need to keep it inside or what you don't need to do anything about it so that is basically comes under pro this process called perception okay so you need to make sure that you know what information you need to process so you need to have that perception aspect of it that you are able to perceive that yes okay this is the information that i can share and this is the information that i don't need to process this is useless pointless information so to be able to differentiate between the essential information the important information compared to information that you do not require those that is basically what you are looking at and that is basically the difference between your perception of information so you your mental processes and your cognitive capacity or your cognitive mechanisms will lie greatly on your perception as well so we know that it lies on memory we know that it lies on thought processes and feelings we also know that it lies on perception um they are also saying that another process that determines how we respond to information is called our reactions which is our conscious thoughts our speech and bodily movements which are called output so our reactions is essentially what is called output and it is also a part of the whole uh, information processing process right so our information processing process let's say has stages and it has steps make sense till here yes okay so they are saying that cognitive theorists but generally holistically you know they just say that every human is programmed in a certain way by nature genetically they are born in a certain way and they or there's obviously similarities between humans and there are differences
Okay. So similarly over here, we're just looking at it from the perspective that yes, is it a computer? So what we're looking at is are we are we sure that um we can say that our brain acts as a computer? So that is essentially the theory that is being focused upon here. Are we clear till here? Yes, we okay. Now they're talking about, let's say, the whole cognitive process is determined on processing information, correct? Now they're basically saying that how do you process information? You need to focus on the stages of processing information, right? So one thing to process information is that you have past experiences and the output or reactions that you had then have now taught you how to react to these experiences or how to be in such a state, okay? Um And they are saying they have characterized it into four different cognitive processes. Number one, they're saying attention. So what happens is that sensory information is only retained for further processing if we pay attention to it. So let's say a lot of things can happen to with us, but that doesn't mean we pay attention to all of them. So what we pay attention to is basically the first step of it, that we need to pay attention to the information that we are going to be focusing upon. Then we need to filter out information that we don't need. Filter out as an eliminate information that we don't need. Let's say I just don't want this part of it. It's pretty useless. So we should have that uh, psyche where we know that we have to eliminate information. Then we, we let's say we rank them as to what's more important, what's less important. Um, then they're saying you will learn about what happens when we get bored, which is a state of low cognitive arousal where we find it difficult to pay attention to the outside world and sometimes start paying greater attention to internally generated thoughts so they're saying that it's not just about you know uh, fine you need the first thing that you need to do in order to process information is to pay attention to that information so that it is passed down your brain and then you are allowed to filter it out just to see what is important information what is not important so you need to filter that out and then you need to make sure that you whatever you are thinking about or whatever your information you're pro you're processing as of right now that is in line with um your thoughts pro thought processes right so you need to have a cognitive arousal with it right other other than that otherwise it's just a generated thought which is basically daydreaming and that is one of the studies that is what one of the studies is about so that's the that's going to be the first part of your uh computer processing and general processing information process okay is that clear does that make sense yes okay then you've got the second process which is language right so the one thing that uh, we very clearly say is different between humans and animals is the use of language the use of tongue the you the the advantage of communication right so once you've got the first step of your cognitive processing which is attention you will use language you will decode your input okay you will make sure that you know what your input is you will put it into verbal terms that okay my input is let's say a dog or whatever right so that whatever you're looking at so you need to verbalize the thoughts that you're having which will basically mean you need to verbalize your perception you have you will need to verbalize your memory and whatever conscious thought that you're having that's the second part of the cog cognitive processing approach then you've got thinking right so after your let's say you filtered it out you know your thought you have you've paid attention to it you have verbalized it and now you have to you're you're on the um thinking stage of it right so they're saying that much of our cognitive processing happens automatically and outside of conscious awareness right so this is basically where we get two approaches which is called system one and system two right so for example the easiest example that i can give you is let's say if i ask you do not calculate this and i go what's two plus two now you know that you i asked you not to calculate it and, I, and you did not put in any effort to calculate it but you still know that two plus two is four right that is system one thinking that's called system one thinking right because it is instinctive you know it right you don't you you just it it is there okay system two thinking on the other hand is long term it's logical so for example if i ask you what is the business plan for this particular segment you will be like okay so the business plan for this particular segment starts at the marketing etc 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 that is to, to system 2 where you took your time you you use the available information with you and then you made and you led to a decision so when you talk about the third stage of thinking 
we say that your the information that you have filtered out and the information that you have verbalized you now have to think about it and you have two different brains basically so not literally just to understand so kahneman said kahneman was a psychologist and he said that system one thinking is the one that is instinctive that is routinely that happens immediately even if you don't try to think and this sort of thinking is also prone to errors you are more likely to make errors right because you are not even thinking about it this is just instinctive you are just saying it out loud right where a system two he says is more logical where you look at all the information that is available to you and then you create something that is effortful okay and these are system two thinking is mostly what i witness thinking is right so makes sense does is this clear yes it's clear me okay and then you have memory so once you've thought you filtered out and now you know what to think about let's say system one system two how will you remember it right so memory is three different cognitive processes encoded encoding storage and retrieval encoding is to make to to record an event in your eyes and in your brain storage is to storing that event in your brain and retrieval is to being able to remember it when you need to remember it so information may be encoded which is represented in the mind in different ways relating to how something looks so these are the types of memory you've got visual visual memory is when you remember something based on how it looks then you have acoustic memory which is basically memory based on some how based on something that is for that you hear okay and then you have semantic memory which is basically associated with other stored knowledge so let's say i remember a story book from my grade 2 syllabus right so that's semantic memory so if you are not paying attention sensory information may only be scored uh, stored for a few seconds uh, but when we are paying attention short term memory can last up to 30 seconds so atkinson and shifrins uh, had this multi store model of memory they that suggested that only they, they will there will on, they will only store long term memory if we consciously link that information with stored um, sorry information with stored knowledge of from long term memory this is called the elaborative rehearsal so basically we had two psychologists atkinson and shefrins and they basically created this model called the multi store model of uh, memory and they said that all the things that are retrieved in your brain that you remember they they this this knowledge will always stay become this will become long term if you keep reminding yourself of it and if you keep practicing it right so for example if i if i learn let's say the what's 3 times 2 3 times 3 3 times 4 so i've learned the whole table for 3 until and unless if i keep visiting back i won't remember it fine it will be a part of my long term memory because i let's say i learned it but my, for it to be a part of the legitimate long term memory i need to revisit it and keep remembering it so that's one thing and that's called elaborative rehearsal like the name suggests that you elaborate on it more and you keep rehearsing it you keep practicing it and this is something that andre study is about are we clear till here yes means okay then you have individual differences in cognitive processing this is something that they are shedding light to or light towards in baron cohen where they're saying that every single person on earth will have a different way of processing cognitive information especially people who have other problems as well so let's say autistic people blind people deaf people these people who are undergoing treatment they will have a very very different cognitive processing mindset as well and that is basically what baron cohen is about so are we clear till here Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Um, we're going to start from the methodology in cognitive approach in the next class, inshallah. Thank you so much for cooperating today. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Rish. Thank you. Have fun. Bye bye.